I want to start this presentation. Oh, can you hear me well? Thanks. Um, I want to start this presentation with a simple question. Do you know that in a Linux system, only the kernel and the browser has much more lines of codes than the compiler that was built, that was used to build those tools? How many lines of codes do you think that a compiler usually has? In this case, GCC compiler. I was in the other presentation and it was a nice graph about we have almost 25, more than 25 million lines of code today in the kernel. So any guess for GCC compiler? GCC compiler is around 50 million lines of code. Last night I ran a simple test uh, for a Git analysis of the repository. I clone it, straightforward Git clone, do the analysis. And this was a nice big, nice graph with matplotlib that was generated. Sorry, getting gini plot. And it came to me the, the, the reason of why starting this presentation with this graph. A week ago I was reading this article, how much does a compiler cost? And it's a nice blog talking about the importance of a compiler in today's world. How much a compiler can affect our lives and how much a compiler can transcend to the performance, security, and functionality of the software that we build every day. The tool that I use with Git stats, on the graph we can see that every year the lines of code, yes, there was a cleanup, yes, um, at some point, yes. <laughs> um, there is always a but in the, in the graph, I know that. Uh, but the numbers of lines of code that we have seen in the last, I don't know, four or five years has been amazing in terms of how much incre increment on lines of code commits a new feature are implemented for, the, for our compilers every year. I'm not gonna show all the patches that are outside. I'm just gonna try to show you some of the useful tools that the compiler and the uh, being utils or, GCC or GLibc already have by now in the last two, three years. And this is a story that I want to connect with you in terms of my personal story. Before being a compiler developer and linker developer, where it's the two communities that I work more, I used to work in a hardware store with my parents. And it was nice that every carpenter or every hard worker came to me and said, hey, I need a tool for this kind of activity. So I needed to look in the catalog and search for the best tool that fulfills the needs for that person. Little is the same of what we have here. I was looking for a definition of a, of a tool change. The tool change is a bunch of tools that we give to the software developers so that they can build much more complex system and launch it to our world in different ways. We have seen in today keynotes how Linux is changing the world in terms of graphics, uh, data analytics, big data, and more things. So what is a tool change uh, today? We know GCC, we know GLibc, but there are much more stops. We, have, we need to have a debugger. Without a debugger, it's almost impossible to think that we can go and develop, right? We need to have a linker. Once the process is running on our operating system, we need to link the libraries that we're gonna be using. The assembly or disassembly, okay? In this case, it's a GNU gas that we have. The binary utils, GNU being utils. Emulator libraries, the standard C library that whether we like it or not, it's there. And yes, there are much more options and we love glibc because it's always there for us. Otherwise, we will be having to develop the, the uh, sign and cosign by ourselves every time that we need it, right? And of course, yes, the, the, the compiler is the first one that, that we use mostly. So what have we built with these tools? Almost the world. We have built operating system kernel, image processing libraries, web server side script and language. PHP is, is built with GCC by definition, right? We build uh, OpenCV, we build the kernel, we build, you, you name it. There are many projects that are the de facto compiler right now, and yes, 
I have ber very good friends in, in, in Clang, Clang and LLVM. Yes, and I, as Greg said one day, we love the fact that there are much more people trying to develop another tool chains. It forces us to be better as a community and also give us the capability to have much more options. We love the idea. We are friends, the two communities. So the first tool that I want to talk to you, it's about security. In the morning, Ariane was talking about security is a factor. There is no way that we can argue with customers to say, well, I can give you good density or good performance, but security is going to be a lack. No way. Nobody wants to be attacked today by anything. First of the tools that I want to present to you is FC protection. There are many kinds of security vulnerabilities. We have seen security vulnerabilities in terms of hardware. I will not talk about those kind of things. I will need an entire slot of speech for that, okay? But the kind of attacks that I will talk to you, it's about the return-oriented programming and cold jam oriented programming. Those are very horrible kind of vulnerabilities. Well, GCC 8 helps to fix those kind of things. This is a very simple ROP attack, okay? For those that have never seen an ROP attack, voila, this is a picture of an ROP attack. We will have a simple main with a simple uh, function echo, and there is a secret function. Yes, I know, it's very simple. It's just for academic purpose. Nobody does this. Nobody calls a function secret function. In the object, then will be very <laughs> easy to attack that function. It's like, come on, attack me. But it's just for, for academic purpose. So we will have a scan of a buffer whose size is 20. Yes, good. But with the scan, which is, by the way, when you compile, the compiler by itself say, please don't use this thing. I mean, there are better things to, to read from the user space that a scan. Um, this is a whole security, a, 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 an entire hole in security, right? And we will see why for some of the audiences that have never seen an ROP attack. So if I run this pretty beautiful, simple to line to execute, uh, I use Python just for the, for, I don't want to type too many times the same character. But what I'm going to do is print um, A 32 times. The 32 came out because 28 plus 4 is the 32 bits that are necessary to put my specific address where I want to go into the space of memory that I want to overlap and rewrite instead of the current return address that I used to have. That is the core of the, re the, the return-oriented programming. The basis of that is the buffer overflow. So what I'm going to do is pass that string plus, at the end, another address, which in this case is the address of secret function. How do I know? Because with a simple object DOM, it was pretty easy to me to say, oh, secret function, so I need to go there. So hint number one, never put your function secret function. Um, and I pass that to my bold binary. So yeah, it's gonna be very easy if you execute that into your Linux system. Um, the only thing that I had to do was compile with minus M32 in M64 is way much more complicated. It's possible to do the same thing, but for academic purpose, it's way much more complicated. On the slides that I will upload at the end of the presentation, there is the link of the source code that you can use and follow the same approach. Um, so yeah, it put the 32, um, 32 bytes in this, in this bunch of A's, and at the end, the address that I want to pass, and it will print, as we saw in the previous code, congratulations, you have entered to the secret function. Nobody calls that function, yet I'm able to do that. And you might say, well, that is not an ROP attack. Yes, I know, but it's just the basic to understand how does it work. Uh, we can pass, instead of a simple uh, address of a function that I want to execute, I can put, um, much more execution things that I want that CPU to do. For example, in this case, I'm passing to ENX uh, the value of 10 and then returning. The point here of an ROP attack is I can, pa I can overwrite instead of going to the current flow that I used to have to wherever I want to go. And there are good friends over there that put shellcode database for study cases. So if you go to that web page, you will have Beam Bash or shell, or you name it. There are many kind of examples that you can use, and instead of passing the address of another function that you want to call, you can actually point 
to a an binary that you want to execute and you can get root privilege uh, access to your system. You can do many harmful things with this kind of attacks. These are called gadgets. Well, GCC introduced a new option for these, FC protection, full branch return and none. This kind of technology, it's based on something that we call control flow and force technology, for a shorter name, set technology, which the good thing is that I think that will be available by this year in terms of uh, CPU architecture. And there are two kinds of uh, approaches for set technology. One we will see is a new instruction and the other one is a shadow uh, stack. How does it work, this kind of thing? The FC protection uh, checks for a valid target address. And um, this will try to have an instrumentation inside your code and do two kind of things. In this case, it's pre preventing from diverge from the current return that you're trying to access, which detects that it's malicious, to the actual that you're supposed to be going in that point. So I like this picture. Imagine that we have a single uh, stack pointer and program counter. So the program counter goes into the read or the scan. It has a stack pointer plus 20 and we have enough 20 spaces. And we start to write hello world at this point. And suddenly we put instead of the 804 or 8004 to 8001. So the stack pointer will go into here. The red, which is the next program counter where it will go, check the address of here and will go straight forward to 8001. That is a picture of how does the return harm could happen into your binary. What this technology is trying to do, it's preventing the flow control to do unexpected target. The text that, hey, wait a minute, you're supposed to go to 8004 and now you're going to 8001. How does it work in terms? Well, first of all, let's check what are the full options that we have. Full branch return and none. Um, the value branch tells the compiler to implement checking on the branch, branch um, indirect branch instruction. For example, call or jumps instructions. The value return implements checking uh, from a function and the value full, it's gonna be both of them on the function and on the branch by definition. The value none will turn off this kind of implementation. Let's put it just in case somebody wants to disable for debugging. The control flow technology, um, the set technology, it will have two things, the shadow stack and indirect branch prediction, uh, indirect branch tracking or IBT. The shadow stack will work in, this, in the next way. We will have an stack that will have a retard, uh, red address. And that red address is gonna make, for example, in the stack, a call to another function or another jump or another branch or another whatever you prefer. At the end of the execution, we will have two return address, one in the new shadow stack and one in the another stack that it was supposed to have in the original place. We are creating a different kind of a stack which is called the shadow stack to compare the two return address. If in this case the vulnerability of a rope happens, it will detect comparing and saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to come back to this red address, not you're telling me that you're coming to a different one. By having two stacks, we'll be able to detect if something in the execution in the second stack after the call jump or whatever branch you prefer to jump, was doing some malicious code by buffer overflow, error P attack, or something else. So we will have two stacks and we will save the two address in two places to say, okay, if there is a difference, something is screwed, something is completely wrong, and I will ex abort the execution of this, of this point. The other thing is the indirect branch tracking. It literally adds a, a new instruction at the end of the branch, okay, to check that the return code, it's actually go where it's supposed to go. And you might be wondering, wait a minute, what happened with my Haswell, Westmere, or any other hardware that it's not with this instruction? Doesn't matter, if you execute this thing now, it will give you a not operation, okay? It's not harmful, just that we will need to wait for the real hardware to have that specific instruction. But to be honest, with the shadow stack, it's good enough for now.
Yeah, more information about this last year, and this is what we are trying to do in, in, in the tool change community. Last year we joined to the Linux plumbers for the very first time, and it was the moment that my, my friend H. E. Lou do a presentation about the set technology and into the Linux plumbers. This year there will be another micro conference for tool change so that we can collaborate even more the two communities. Let's cut for performance. Flop interchange. Well, I like this, uh, this, this flag especially. The flop interchange, it's kind of an optimization for the nested force that we have. It's by default enabled with minus O3, and you might be at to let me, um, with the point. Victor, you were in embedded Linux conference. We barely use minus O2, we mostly use minus OS because we want to do our binary small instead of faster. It was, and correct me if I'm wrong, that was true 10 years ago. Today embedded, it's not only about size, but also about the speed. So, Let's take the first example. Imagine that you have uh, two fours. One of the, in this case, Y is going to 100 and X is going to 1000. Increasingly, 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 and going forward, forward, forward. And we will talk about doing a multiplication of X by Y and assign it to the value that we have in this case, okay? What we want in software is this. What the actually hardware, it's going to be a little bit different, and we need to be aware of how does a loop do. You might be wondering, well, if I do this one side or the other, it shouldn't affect to me. Actually, it does. We have a CPU, and we have a cache memory, and the main memory. Suppose that we have to go to the main memory for the real data, to the cache memory as a beginning. What we're gonna be reading with this approach is gonna be K00, 10, 20, and 30. We read the memory by a bunch of data instead of, a of like a line. So we will have first, the CPU is gonna have in cache these first lines from the, from the main memory. And okay, it's nice, I have K0, wait a minute. Now I need K1.0. So it's not in my cache line. I have to go for another cache line. So I have to go to the main memory, bring it back a different one, and discard this one. I spend CPU time going to the main memory, bring it up the mem to the cache, and not using just for one single unit. Memory facts. When the processor access to an array element, for the first time, it retrieves an entire cache line of data from the main memory to the cache, uh, from the memory to the cache. If the rest of the data is not used, it, it, sorry, if the rest of the data will be used soon, this is a major performance bust, okay? So the most amount of memory that we use from in the cache that was bringing it from the main memory, the best that is for us because we spend time, power, and anything going to the main memory and bring it into the cache. So it's better that we use that amount of data. If on the other hand, we only use very few, in the, like, I'm, like in my example, only one of the elements from the line that I used to have, it's a performance loss. So when we apply the F loop interchange flag, the code is transformed and now we have X 1000 here and Y to the, to the 100. So the approach is different. Now it's gonna be K0, K01, K02, K03, and there it goes to the K1, to the K almost 1000. So what happened in hardware is that now I am able to access to K00, K01, K02, K03, which is in the same cache line that I have over here. So I don't have to discard of this cache line, go back to the main memory, and come back to cache two. I can use much more of my memory that I have in my cache instead of going that many times to the main memory, okay? So highly recommended to use this F loop interchange. It's one of the main reasons why it also with minus O3 in GCC give a very good performance. Not everything it's about vectorization, also about the way that how do we access to memory cares. Code hoisting optimizations. Uh, 
partial redundancy el elimination, PRE. This flag I see like, it's going to check my code and tell me where did I was very dumb. <laughs> and I didn't realize that couldn't be better. I joke with my um, students, I forgot to mention, I, I give um, compilers basics on university at hometown and I joke, sometimes the compilers are a little bit more smart than me. I mean, smarter than me, sometimes, just sometimes. Uh, this, is the, this is one of the cases. Uh, eliminates unnecessary codes that is not being uh, executed. Let's take this very simple example, and I did it yesterday for just academic purpose, don't judge me, I know that I suck at coding, so let's go. We have a test function in A, B, C, and G. We defined D and E as any integers. We check if A, anything different than zero, we go into this path or this branch. Else, we go to another branch in this case, and D is gonna be B minus C, E is gonna be B multiplied by C, I can see that I, if I calculate one time, I can reuse in the other case, plus G. And the end, the return is gonna be the value that I have here for D that will diverge according to A plus E, which will be only accessible in the case of the else. If I go in through this one, E is gonna be zero if I define it here before or anything else. And I'm gonna pass one, two, three, four, not because it's important for the code because it was very easy for me to put it there when I was coding yesterday. And, well, F code hosting, it's on minus O2 optimization level. Remember, for compilers, I forgot to mention, the optimization is a bunch, it's, it's like an onion. We have layers. So O0, it's no optimization. O1 is just the very beginning of optimization. O2 will be O1 plus something else. O3 will be O1, O2 plus something else. And that's the, that's the limit, we don't add O4. There was a discussion in the GNU compiler list and say, do we need an O4? And they say, no, 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 O3 is good enough, right? We don't want to have that more layers, not a cake. Um, also, this flag, it's, in, it's important to mention that it's in, in minus OS, okay? So it's also possible to use this for doing a small, OS stands for small binaries that we want to generate. So these are the object dumps of the same test function executed in my um, Linux system. And let's go straight forward. Uh, in this case, with GCC hosting minus 01, which will avoid the use of that specific flag, uh, I'm doing, in this case, two times the multiplication, doing a comparison, and then doing the addition, okay? I'm oh, sorry, the comparison is here. Um, and then doing the addition of this case, at the addition that we see at the end of D plus E. In this case, with hoisting minus O2, we are just doing one single multiplication and the addition over here. We are, rem we are reducing the amount of times that we are doing the multiplication by definition and doing way much more less comparison, okay? So hoisting is gonna transform, first of all, yes, it transforms the code that I'm going to pass to the CPU and it also eliminates redundancy in terms of how many instructions the CPU needs to generate. The compiler is the last defense against bad code to the actual CPU. CPU are not that smart. They will only execute in every time that a scheduler deploy a process all the code that we want. So it's the responsibility of the compiler to provide the best code to the CPU. Um, this is another one, and this is not for the compiler, this is for the DGLibc. I was joking before about whether we like it or not, GLibc. GLibc is one of the heroes that we have in our back supporting us every day. It has all the sine, cosine, mathematical things, POWs, all the things that we will not be willing to do every day, it's there, right? Um, one of the optimization that happened in the last GLibc in, it was introduced in November, December of last year, is the optimization for sine and cosine. Uh, I'm not a mathematical guy, so I don't know who needs sine and cosine at the same time, but there is a function for that. Uh, no, trust me, I, I didn't want to ask in the, in the community, so they will throw me potatoes, but yes, there are somebody outside in the industry that needs sine and cosine at the same time. And what is happening right now is, instead of doing the approach by difficult assembly instructions 
and you can see the patches. Uh, I put the links in the, in the presentation. The elimination that HLU did for sine and cosine before this optimization to after this optimization, it's huge. It's huge, right? And he's not using vectorization or, um, yes, he's doing function, uh, fuse multiplication addition, but the reason why he's doing fuse multiplication addition is because he's using the Taylor approximation. So now sine and cosine from GLFC to 2.29 is gonna use Taylor approximation for going into the, to know exactly the value that I'm asking for. I pass to the sine and cosine function the angle that I want to, or the gradient variable that I want to calculate for sine and cosine. It needs to, or it needs to re returns to me the value of sine and cosine. That's the only job that has to do. Well, and now instead of doing with heavy mathematical things, it's gonna go with uh, Taylor approximation, which is, to be completely honest, divisions, multiplications, nothing that complicated, okay? And there are good papers outside that proves that actually this is a very close to what we used to have. Remember, um, Taylor approximation or polynomial P algorithm approximation, it's I'm gonna try to be as close as possible to a function, which in this case is sine of x, using this kind of uh, polynomial approach, the, more, the larger that the, that the polynomial becomes, the closer that it goes to the sine of this, in this case. There are some advantages of having this kind of uh, improvement uh, for the polynomial method. The memory requires necessary to implement, it's quite small. So the amount of memory reduced by this um, improvement, the, the, the numbers for, for the performance improvement are on the patch, but it goes around, for example, in terms of performance of execution from 20 to 40% in the micro benchmark that was run it, because yes, we have to prove that it has a performance improvement when we accept the patch. So HLU, who is the guy that sent this patch, uh, put it on the commit, how many, uh, the, the amount of performance that was gained because of this. Only require multiplication, addition, and subtraction of floating points numbers, which is not very much CPU cycles. Um, it's part of a, I put the, um, on the presentation will be the link of where is the library that is doing this thing. But yeah, before going to developer experience, this is one of the core things that we don't see every day, but it's there for us, right? So the first call of action is try in your operating system or in your deployment to use the latest technology that we as a tool change community deploy for you. There is a very hard work for doing that and, and that you can use it. Developer experience. I definitely like this one. It's the, my favorite in all the presentation. Had somebody realized that since the latest GCC they define that, hey, you don't know how to spell color. <laughs> so I'm going to show you that it's color, not color. GCC detects that. And the amount of job that has to happen in the back end of GCC, it's huge. Just for us to let us know that we're spelling wrong. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, in this case, yes, I spell a decoration for, for this one. So the, the, the smarter fix hints, it's included by definition in all the GCC. I mean, only, I, I don't know any distribution right now that remove these flags when, compile, when, when providing the compiler. If it's providing, for example, Fedora, um, it's using this one, and I think that Ubuntu is also enabled in the latest version. Uh, well, even, and, and you might be saying, well, that case is very simple. I mean, it's, it's a simple typo and things like that. No, it goes way much more on typos. Uh, and for a small project, for a simple few thousand of lines of codes, more, no more than 100, it's fine. But what happened when our, how, how many lines of code usually a production system based on C has? More than 100, more than 200. Increasing the lines of code in C is very simple. Very simple, right? You blink one day, you wake up the next weekend, boom, 200 lines of codes, right? Well, F diagnostic generation patch, make the patch for you. 
So even if you have a huge warning errors, whatever you want, run that flag and it will generate a patch for you. So you can git am the file and fix all the things that you have wrong in your code, okay? So yes, come back to the phone that we used to have. Can I just literally hit randomly something and the compiler will fix it for me? Yes, we arrive to the point in the future when the compiler can fix it for you. You just need to apply the patch. The next steps that we're talking in the community is should, the, should we put a flag that say apply the patch for me or? <laughs> Now, F-diagnostic, it's another one uh, for, with WeedPath uh, format, where it's possible to select a different kind of format that we want to print. Um, format is text or JSON. And the reason why we added JSON as a format example for our case is because it's easy for later to post-process, right? Imagine this developer system into your teams or for your personal experience where you have warnings and instead of going one by one, you can create an, a smart algorithm that select them or cluster them or give you, a, goes into um, a dashboard, anything you want. The old days where I sit in my computer, develop the code and magically after fairs comes to my mind and happen, the magic is not longer what we do every day. It's a continuous integration, continuous deployment system that we have to deliver to customers in less than a month. How many months do, you, do we have for deploying an IoT system? Around three, things like that. I mean, it's really fast the amount of time that we need to spend for deploying. So if, the, uh, if we say gcdiagnostic.c, in this case, it, this C example has some mistake, and we run fdiagnostic format JSON, it will generate the, the, the JSON format in, in a different approach uh, than in just in the text. If I pass that through a JSON reader, for me it's way much more easy to, to, to read and for another tool to classify your cluster and things like that. Oh, and maybe the last one. Um, I don't know how much time do we have, but uh, the last one is F3 switch conversion. We have a simple foo function with switches, two, three, four, five, six. And the variable how, it's gonna be later assigned to 205, 305, 405, five. As a human, we can easily see that, hey, wait a minute, it's two multiplied by 100 and not five. Well, now the compiler can detect that. This is a snip of the code of the test case that was added to the compiler in GCC 9, um, and now it transformed that into this linear function. 100 multiplied by how plus five for this example. If I change instead of five it will to eight, it will detect eight, okay? So it's not hard coded, it's, it's just for this example. And these are the object dumps, because in the beginning when I realized that, and, and in the mailing list, I didn't believe it. So I said, I have to test it by myself. <laughs> it's too pretty cool to be, to be, to be real. So yes, the full function, this is the full function without using that one, that flag, in this case, the F3 switch conversion. Uh, it's a lot of jumps, movements, jumps, um, additions, and this is if I add this flag. If I add this flag, I will do a multiplication and addition. Here you will see the I, the I move and the I and the add exactly as I describe it here. Yeah, that's a great question. The part of generic in this term is, it has to have at least this kind of approach. We have to have an element that will be, um, an element that will try to take a variable, plus here could be an addition, multiplication, division, and things like that. It tries to be as much generic as possible. Remember, this is the, in, in the tree of the compiler, we have the lexical analyzer, the syntax analyzer, the, lexi, the, the semantic analyzer, then we generate um, intermediate code, and then comes the optimization. This is the part when the compiler sits and say, what can I do in this term? So it's as generic as we try to do it. It's not perfect, 
but we're trying to improve it. So yeah, as you can see, it's pretty magic in terms of, hey, I used to have this bunch of instruction that was going to be passed to the CPU, and now I have an iMul and that, and detects the logic that I maybe didn't realize myself. Because if I would be able to realize myself, I will not code this switch in the first place, okay? And there are more, okay? There are much more things that we can do with the uh, related technology. For example, F now the agnostic show line numbers, pretty easy for debugging. Um, a warning for allocation larger than that, and you put an equal here, and you can pass the number. So imagine that for your embedded application, you want to check if I have an allocation more than a specific lines of a specific amount of bytes. I will be able to do to detect those ones with uh, W alloc larger than equal to 1024 or 22048, things like that. Okay. And there is also a pretty system, new system calls in GLIB, in GLIBC um, 229. Get CPU. Get CPU will print me the CPU and the NUMA node where my application is standing. So I'm pretty sure that for embedded and also for servers that it's pretty useful. If I'm able to know where am I standing, remember, this is a wrapper that used to be in the kernel, yes, now it's a system call, okay? If you Google search for Git CPU, yes, it will find out that it has been in man Linux page years ago in kernel space. Now we have a pretty an amazing uh, system call that we can use in user space, okay? I want to close this part with this picture. Taking advantage that we are in San Diego and there is a nice uh, front water close to us with nice uh, boats. I like boats, by the way. GCC, GLIBC, Bing Utils, and all the tool change team together, we want to say that we are happy to produce more tools for you so that you can propel the software development that you do every day. And of course, the LLVM and CLANG community is more than happy to develop those kind of tools so that you can create way much more things. Use the latest version, find box in our approaches for optimization, complain to us and say, hey, could you please do it this more generic? Yes, I can try to do much more generic. Or have you think about this warning? Today in the morning, somebody called me and say, uh, we, we, we are um, friends since many years ago, and we say, is there any way that we can make it much more easy to get the, the, the profiling information from the kernel on boot time from the debugger? And I was like, hmm, I don't know, could be a nice plugin, but I haven't thought about it. So when I came back, I might talk with some of my friends, Andy Clean or H. Lou, about that kind of plugin. We are here to communicate to you that we can listen your needs based on your daily jobs that you have. Example of that um, operating system that I, I'm part of the, this, um, I'm part of the community, is the Clay Linux operating system project. Uh, we have much more information on these web pages about GCC7, GCC8, um, all these examples are over there in code and with much more details. And there will be a GCC9, um, GLIBC3229 tool change uh, block also over there in that web page. So all the code, all the comments, all the things that I presented there are a summary of these three blocks uh, that, are, that will be public. The last one will be public in a few weeks, maybe two weeks. That's a backup, that's supposed to be say thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a backup, thank you. Uh, I don't know how much time do we have. Do we have time for questions? Yes. Can, can you, you know, let me pass the microphone because I have problems hearing, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Common 
Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, code hoisting tried to, for example, detect these kind of um, uses of, of, of a multiplication and assign to a variable and split into maybe two or more, but using less amount of variable. In, yeah, less amount of, reuse as much variable. For example, in this case, we'll say B multiplied by C will be assigned to D and replace this one uh, by D in the case detecting that one, it's always going to be in, in, in one, in that case. Detect that uh, one is gonna be not passing by a co common line interface and, and the other, and, and go straight forward. That is the approach for that one. For the other one, I haven't tested much. The, 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 um, the other kind of, um, of reducing of code that you mentioned. So. Hmm. Well, I, I, I agree with the question there. You know, I find that thing to be. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will need to do that experiments because I, I didn't test the code hoisting in that approach in a for or, or taking it out of for a loop. Yeah. I realized that it reduced the amount of code in my case or change it, but I, I was not aware of that. Thank you. I will, I will investigate about it. Yeah. Yes. I guess part of what it does is make check whether there's any red on the text, is that right? Check for modification if there's any red on the text. The one check is the B a register for the B number. Mm -hmm. They when they make a function call, there's any red on the text there or not. And that function calls another function for the previous one that wasn't checked. Yep. Yeah, can you rep uh, um. Yeah, so um, say when you're uh, doing an add, you have add off for the first one. Yeah, I'm gonna pass you the microphone. It's way much better. So um, when, you, um, when you have um, an architecture that uses a register for return address, like ARM, um, so you have LR register to keep the return address, yeah? Um, FTF protection, um, does it take into account scenarios uh, or architectures which use uh, register to hold return address? FTF protection will be on for x86 at the moment. It has been tested because the set technology is coming for x86 two, three, four weeks. For that case of having the returning address, that's what I was discussing, for example, in the beginning with Rust. Uh, with Stephen Russell, because he was talking about that kind of approach, and I need to talk to him about how Seth is going to feed into that. Right. Um, so in that in that case, um, that return address ultimately goes on the stack if there's nested function calls. So if a function calls, oh, for, for the nested, yeah, uh, that yeah. yeah, for the nested set will have in that case the shadow stack and the branch uh, and the X branch structure to be the only solution. So it will have a stack, a double stack, a double stack, a double stack, yeah. And if not doesn't work, the, the, the return address instruction at the end of the branch that you have. Thanks. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, this, it's good luck with trying to compete him with, with that part, but. The, the set technology is the first step on that to having the, the IBT instruction to detect these kind of errors in, for, for security vulnerability is the first of the, one of the first approach. So set technology will be enabled for Xeon and other ones at the end. I, I think, I, I don't, don't take me by, by hard reading, but it's supposed to be in this year, supposed to be. But for that case, the problem is how long do you go to the, how deep do you go? That's where the narrative is wrong as well. How do you lock it down? Has to be full yeah. yeah. Because for in, in the very simple example that we have over here with the hello world, yes, we say a stack pointer minus 20, but how do we know that it's not minus 40, minus 400? If not, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.